Good morning from Washington, D.C. I'm Chris Chivas, the director of the Carnegie Endowment's program on American statecraft. And this is Pivotal States, a series of discussions that examine America's strategic choices with major world powers. Today, we're talking about Brazil, whose size, democratic traditions, and importance to global climate change make it a pivotal state. This is one of the largest, this is the largest democracy in Latin America and one of the largest in the world. It's also Latin America's largest economy and home to large reserves of natural resources, many of which could become the target of competition between the United States and China. Over half of the gigantic Amazon rainforest also lies in Brazil. The survival of this rainforest is vital to curbing global carbon emissions. Some observers think that the U.S.-Brazil relationship has been underdeveloped, given Brazil's regional and growing global importance. But historically, Brazil has preferred a non-aligned foreign policy and embraced the idea that world politics is increasingly multipolar. It's a founding member of the BRICS group, along with India, Russia, China, and South Africa. It's not surprising then that the last few years have seen a number of twists and turns in U.S.-Brazil relations. President Jair Bolsonaro closely aligned Brazil with the Trump administration, so closely that it earned him the sobriquet Tropical Trump in some circles. But that closer alignment came along with real strains in Brazilian democracy. And when President Biden came to office here in the United States, he had little interest in pursuing the relationship with Bolsonaro. Only when Bolsonaro was defeated by Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, usually called Lula, back in 2022, did a new opportunity for cooperation between the United States and Brazil emerge. Lula visited Washington in February of this year, and our two presidents promised to work together on strengthening democracy, on human rights, and on the environment. It seemed like a positive step in the relationship. But Lula's decision to then visit China, where he got a warm embrace from President Xi, along with his advocacy for a negotiated settlement to the war in Ukraine, irritated the White House and made some critics here in Washington question how much space there really was for deepening bilateral relations. Well, we're here on Pivotal States to talk about all this today. How will this key bilateral relationship play out? What are the strategic stakes for the United States? How should Washington best address President Lula's approach to foreign policy? Is there an opportunity to build a mutually beneficial relationship, even as Brazil maintains its traditional foreign policy independence? Now with me here this morning to talk about this are two top minds on Brazil-US relations. Margaret Myers is the director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue on the faculty of Georgetown University and a former Pentagon official. Matias Spector is professor of international relations at FGV in Sao Paulo, and also a non-resident scholar with me here at the Carnegie Endowment. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret, let me start with you. How should we be thinking about America's interests in Brazil in the broadest sense? Why does Brazil matter to the United States? Well, it's, a, it's an important, thanks Chris, first of all, for the invitation, and it's a really important question. Um, you know, I, Brazil matters in general for, for a lot of reasons, many of which you just mentioned, right? Uh, just at the most obvious level, it's the largest country in South America. It accounts for half the continent's population and territory. It's about, you know, represents about 40% of the GDP of all of Latin America. Um, it additionally plays a very prominent role in, in the geopolitical realm, as you've alluded to. It's been central in rethinking the current global order from within the UN, certainly, right? But, but mostly through the BRICS configuration, where it has pushed alongside China mostly, right, for a much more prominent role for the global south. Um, the country also retains an expert foreign service, right, and has led peacekeeping missions in the region and, and far beyond. And in fact, during the, the recent G7 summit in Hiroshima, Lula, Brazil's president, right, uh, called much, much needed attention to, to the Haiti crisis, for example, which, um, you know, has not, not been highlighted enough, um, whether by the U.S. or others. And under Lula, 
you know, who envisions an even more prominent global role for Brazil. The country has also involved itself in, as we've mentioned, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, envisioning itself as a possible arbiter of peace, but while also making several highly controversial statements about the war, siding at times with Russia's position. And then, you know, Chris, as you mentioned, Brazil is also home to most of the Amazon or the lungs of the world, right? So mm -hmm. it's pivotal in fighting against climate change. And so with all of this in mind, Brazil is a country that inevitably has some impact on U.S. global interests and domestic interests for that matter, right? As a major economic partner for the U.S. and a main source of Latin American students, uh, workers, right, study, uh, in the U.S., um, among other really critical people-to-people -people ties, which are, you know, longstanding. For the Biden administration, right, Brazil is also a critical example of a functioning democracy in the region, even though, you know, it, like the U.S., has had some, some difficulties of late. And with this in mind, we've seen, you know, considerable U.S. support uh, for democratic institutions and outcomes of Br in Brazil, uh, electoral outcomes. So to answer your question, you know, for officials in Washington, my sense is that Brazil is seen through multiple lenses, right? On, on the one hand, um, as, a, as a critical actor and potential partner, right, especially in the fight against, against climate change and upholding democratic values, right, but then also as a potentially important obstacle. Um, to U.S. efforts to defend the international order, for example, especially as concerns Russia and Ukraine, but also, uh, you know, more broadly as, as Brazil and other countries challenge U.S. dominance, including that of the U.S. dollar. And we've heard a lot about that of, of late, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, it's my sense that this ambivalence has had a, a cooling effect, right, on, on U.S. optimism about the current administration, which was high at the beginning of, of Lula's presidency. Um, but and also, you know, a possible cooling effect on, on U.S. engagement with the country in recent months, although we have seen, obviously, some overtures. That's great uh, to get us started. Uh, Matthias, let me just uh, pose the same basic question to you. I mean, looking at it now, you're you're in Sao Paulo, so you're giving us the Brazilian perspective. But you also have uh, spent a lot of time here uh, in, in the United States, including at Princeton uh, and at Carnegie. Um, how should the United States, in your view, be thinking about its interests with regard to Brazil? Why does Brazil matter to the United States, given the many other priorities that the U.S. has to address these days? Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, and it's such a treat to be here and to share this with, with Margaret. I broadly agree with Margaret's answer. I will add a couple of, a couple of things, uh, especially from a world that one looks at from Sao Paulo, right? The, the main reason why Brazil matters for the United States, and it has mattered historically, is the fact that Brazil is the largest country in the one region of the world where the United States is what you know, experts call a regional hegemon. This is America's region, the Americas, right? And Brazil is the one country that is big enough and has um, resources enough to both cooperate with the United States, but also clash with the United States here and there. Um, historically, Brazil has been very cooperative with the United States. And yet this is a relationship that never really took off, even when the two sides have a lot of interest in common and they share a, you know, a similar view of what's going on. For example, now on the issue of Venezuela, for the first time in many years, the Biden administration and the Lula administration have a common read of what's happening in Venezuela. And yet, even then, they find it very hard to cooperate. So Brazil matters because when Brazil moves in the region, it afflicts America's interests in the one part of the world where uh, the United States has, um, is unrivaled. Now, as Margaret was pointing out, all the geopolitical changes are beginning to unsettle this. And in particular, we're talking about the role of China and Chinese influence in the Americas. China has been investing big time in Latin America for 20 years, not the least because the United States invited China 20 years ago to invest big time in Latin America. And now, for the first time in many, many years, the United States confronts a region in which, you know, there are things happening that didn't happen before. And within that context, Brazil matters. So that's the first one, the geopolitical box that Margaret was talking about. There's another side to this, why Brazil matters, moving forward. 
And these are two very important things that people in DC normally don't talk about. The first one is that in the next 20 years, Brazil is gonna be a major, major player with the United States in providing food to the rest of the world. Energy in the form of food supplies. And in the context of the geopolitical changes we're seeing, these will make Brazil matter all the more. The second one is that Brazil is now becoming a big player in the oil field. Brazil was never a significant oil exporter, but it's becoming one. And although this was never the case before, and therefore there's no track record of US-Brazil cooperation on the oil front, this is something that will impose itself in coming years. Then there is the issue of climate change that you both refer to. And here, what I would mention is this. The reason why Brazil matters so much is that, be, is, the, is that Brazil is a major driver of deforestation. And this is not something Brazil can deal on its own, partly because it needs money it doesn't have to compensate those losers uh, if deforestation were to come to an end, but partly because there's so much political interest at the local level in Brazil for deforestation, that Brazil will need international cooperation big time to, to turn the tide, right? There's another element to this, which is very important that, and it's that deforestation is Brazil is linked to the global supply chain of cocaine and other drugs is related to transnational crime. So the issue of climate change in Brazil intersects with transnational crime, which is, of course, one of the biggest items in, you, in America's relationship with Latin America. And finally, uh, Margaret was correctly pointing out that, you know, Brazil matters partly for procedural reasons, because you need Brazil's cooperation if you want to get things done in the UN General Assembly or in the WTO, and that's the Brazil in the BRICS. But when we look at many other multilateral fora, Brazil matters for reasons that one doesn't normally uh, realize. So, for example, NATO operations in the South Atlantic, they require procedural cooperation with Brazil. Not that Brazil is a veto player. Brazil is very, very weak internationally, but it can make things more difficult. As with the BRICS, it can make things more difficult. Or consider the International Atomic Agency, for example. Brazil is one of the few countries that enriches uranium, mines uranium, is building a nuclear-propelled submarine there. Or consider the law of the sea. Brazil has historically been a major player there. So for procedural reasons, it's important for Washington to have channels of communication with Brasilia that are functional, let's say. This is a this is a really impressive and long list of uh, items. I mean, if we're talking about Brazil's rising importance as a global player, its sort of regional gravitational pull, its uh, you know economic importance to the United States, uh, its vital importance uh, to climate change, plus all the other issues that you just raised. The the question is, you know, some of these there are there are tensions between them, right? I mean, because obviously, as we as we have all mentioned already. There was, uh, there has been some um, tension between Biden's attempt to relaunch the relationship on the grounds of democracy, human rights, uh, and the environment, and, and Lula's preference uh, or continuation of a traditional Brazilian preference for viewing the world through the lens of multipolarity. So, how should the United States prioritize? I mean, you know, what should be first? I mean, when when U.S. diplomats. Um, uh, sit down with Brazilian officials when the president sits down with with Lula. What should be at the top of the list? Which of these should be really should should, should be emphasized first? Margaret, do you have do you have thoughts on this? What would you put first? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very difficult question to answer. I think, um, I mean, just as as Matias has pointed off pointed out that this relationship, for whatever reason, despite these converging interests, has never really taken off. Right, the two aren't always tangoing, so to speak. And so, I think you know the main challenge that the U.S. faces at the moment, and you kind of see that the administration grappling with this is how is how to engage effectively with uh, you know with Brazil in ways that will ensure the greatest alignment on issues of interest to both countries. You know whether. Uh, you know, it's 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 climate, or it's 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 democratic, you know, governance, or it's uh, issues, you know, further afield. Um, 
you know, uh, but, you know, and especially in democratic governments, I think at, at a moment when, you know, next door in Argentina, Javier Millet, right, a, a radical right wing and climate denying presidential candidate has, has, has just very recently surged in popularity. So, um, you know, I think the question is, is what mechanisms? right will will make uh the most progress in in achieving this alignment and that's really this is really the question facing the administration right now the u.s brazil economic relationship is already strong right brazil is already a top destination for the u.s private sector and increasingly so amid challenges in other parts of the region um so the economic relationship has its own momentum of sorts um Still, I mean, I think there's a sense that that boosting economic ties in ways that address both countries' interests is important to the relationship and will continue to ensure a degree of collaboration potentially on these various issues that, that it, you know, that Matias has mentioned and, and that you highlighted, Chris. Um, and certainly there was a recent, you know, meeting between Biden and and Lula, in which you know they highlighted some possible cooperation on on job creation. So there is, I think, this sense that, that this continued, you know, strengthening of the economic relationship will have benefits further afield. Um, but you know, in general. Role. The economic ties have not, at least yet, right, ensured an alignment on on v on views on all issues, you know, including many of the uh, of great importance to both countries. And as we've noted, there are plenty of areas of, of discord in the relationship. So how and whether Brazil can be more firmly brought into the fold, especially on, on Ukraine, right, and other issues of this sort. Um, uh, and, you know, it, I, I believe this is a critical question for the U.S. and other and other partners at present. So it's less a matter of what should be prioritized and what mechan or th than what mechanisms should be used uh, to achieve some degree of alignment and to ensure that the the relationship really stays on track from a bilateral perspective. I mean, some some um, critics here, some critics here in Washington would you know would argue critics of Lula and his foreign policy would argue that there really is no trade space for the relationship that Biden seemed to want to build um, because Lula is willing to um, you know to to pursue at least some relationship with Vladimir Putin and and pursue a, a much warmer relationship with President Xi. Matias, do you think that's, is that correct? I mean, is does this, does Lula's embrace of a multipolar foreign policy basically mean that this relationship, as you put it, which has never taken off, will never take off? Or, or, or should the United States, is there another approach that the U.S. could take? That's great. So I think it won't take off precisely for the reasons that you lay out. But not mm. taking off doesn't mean this is going to be a disaster. Okay. And it doesn't mean the United States should ignore Brazil. So the way I see it, the administration has three choices, basically. It can ignore Brazil. It's happened in the past. The United States can afford to ignore Brazil and deal with the problems when they arise, as they arise. The bulk of the last 30 years, it's a story of the United States not caring much. The second option is to try and engage Brazil, which is precisely what this administration tried to do when Lula took office. It's what the Obama administration tried to do when he took office. And it's what the Trump administration tried to do when he took office. And it never really worked. The problem with engagement not working is, of course, that it all, then the, in the United States, people reverse back to ignoring Brazil. My take is very similar to Margaret's, and it's to manage the relationship in full knowledge that there will not be alignment. And the reason that there won't be alignment is that if you're a big, relatively big country in America's regional hegemony, at the same time, the United States provides lots of public goods for you. It's also the main source of threat to you, not military threat. You know, the United States has an equal ability to impose costs on Brazil. So it's only natural that Brazil will want to diversify its relationships. It's only natural that the Brazil will say we will not alienate Russia or China because a unipolar system is not good. Unipolarity since the 90s, between the 90s and the mid 2000s, was not a good deal for Brazil, nor was bipolarity during the Cold War, mind you. Hmm. So in the heads of Brazilian, not just diplomats, elites across the board, and even the people, the best distribution of power is one that is multipolar because it allows a country like Brazil to try and counterbalance 
America's enormous influence in Brazil and in its near abroad, let's say. So my suggestion to the administration would be to, to say, acknowledging that this is a reality and that Brazil will never join the United States and align with the United States and that Brazil will always play bricks or whatever form of multipolarity there is at the time, what can we actually do together that is, you know, step by step, it's piecemeal. This is not going to take off. It's not going to be an India type of story, counterbalancing China. You will have to manage this relationship gently, softly, probably through back channels. The institutional channels are not there. The minute you bring this to the official institutions, it collapses. And it's focusing on a few things that matter. The ones I think, and I think Margaret agrees, is you know energy, food, climate change. Practical things where you can get purchase from domestic constituencies that will be invested in having a productive bilateral relationship, if not anything that smacks of alliance, alignment, or in the view of Brazilians, subservience to the United States. That's, that's really interesting. Margaret, please, yeah. Yeah, can I, add to, I, I, I couldn't agree more with Matthias. And just to add on, you know, on China or on some of these issues where it's, it's a bit of a no-go, right? Where there's not a lot of room to maneuver, where we don't see a lot of progress being made. It's still worthwhile to consider some of the nuance, right? In, for example, the Brazil-China relationship, right? This isn't a, a full-on perfect, you know, uh, ideal dynamic that, that even though there is, you know, a considerable commitment on both sides to engaging more extensively in strengthening that bilateral relationship. Um, there's, I mean, there's very imbalanced trade, right? There are, there will probably be some, some disagreement on who to include in, a, in an expanded BRICS configuration or, or not, right? As we, we'll see in the, the BRICS summit coming up, but, um, you know, and then beyond that, uh, you know, we've seen actually some some U.S. and Brazil cooperation in the area of, of nuclear technology. I mean, I'll be very limited. Right. And also in space policy. So there are things right that can be done. So it's, it's understanding what is possible within the realm of reality. And the realm of reality is very much as Matias described it. Right. There are low hanging fruits and then there are not. And, you know, but even within those other high hanging fruits, I guess we want to call them that. There are ways to think about, you know, some of the nuance there and, and where opportunities may lie. So, Margaret, you, I mean, you're, you're a leading expert on the role of China in Latin America as a whole. I mean, so is what you're saying that the United States should be cognizant of Brazil's relationship, deepening relationship with China, but not make too much of it? I mean, basically, yes. It, 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 we've seen attempts by two administrations now, especially under the Trump administration, to try to dissuade Brazil from engaging with China on very in various areas, but especially those of security concern to the U.S. and and tech, especially you know, with a lot of talk about five G and Huawei and and the potential challenges and and security threats posed by those those technologies and Huawei equipment um, that fell on. Uh, I mean, there was it, it resonated to a degree with the with the Bolsonaro administration, and there were some efforts to to perhaps consider uh, you know purchasing other other equipment for um, for use at least by 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 the government or by certain, you know, parts of, of, of the Brazilian militaries. And Matias would know more about the specifics of that. But, um, but uh, you know, I mean, Lula made it loud and clear, very clear, you know, during his visit to, to China that, that, you know, collaboration, not just with China, but with Huawei and, and other tech giants was very much on the table and would be, would be moving ahead uh, with visits, right, to, to Huawei, um, factories to Huawei, you know, sort of showcase facilities. And so, um, yeah, it's not, it's just, it just hasn't made a dent. And it's not just in Brazil, it's across the entire region. So it's a matter not of trying to dissuade these countries from engaging with China, which happens to be a top trade partner, right? And a major investor, including in sectors where the U.S. isn't touching at all and or our other partners, uh, partner nations. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a no-go. Uh, that said, there are areas where Brazil and the U.S. can cooperate, um, you know, in policy setting, agenda setting, and for example, as I mentioned, nuclear policy, space policy, other areas of interest to Brazil from an economic and strategic and political perspective. Um, 
uh, where you know they they may or not may not align with with China, um, and so it's a matter of thinking about this a little bit more strategically uh, and understanding really what would appeal to Brazil and what is in Brazil's best interests as we approach uh, you know Brazil for cooperation on these issues. Very very interesting. This is Pivotal States. I'm Chris Chivas, the director of the Carnegie Endowment's program on American statecraft. Um, we're going to turn, uh, we're here talking about Brazil today, and we're going to turn to the audience for questions uh, in a few minutes. But before we do that, Matias, let me ask you to come in on what Margaret was just talking about. I mean, how should the United States policymakers understand this apparently open-ended uh, relationship between Brazil and China? Is it really open-ended or are there natural limits, as Margaret was just suggesting? Um, I think Margaret is spot on. Let me speak to the limitations, to the constraints that Brazilians, irrespective whether they're Bolsonaro, Lula, or any other Brazilian leader, confront in dealing with China. There are two things here. First of all, although Brazil is increasingly dependent on China, and China is increasingly dependent on commodities coming from Brazil, and China is very exposed to Brazil. For example, a third of energy distribution is now owned by Chinese capitals in Brazil. The relationship is not an easy one. Mm. China treats Brazil in a manner that is very top-down. Meetings at the BRICS are very scripted. Brazil finds itself having very little room of maneuver with China. Brazil can have a far more flexible set of conversations with the United States than he can with Beijing. Beijing has a very set view of where Brazil fits in the global pecking order, and he's not at the top of that pecking order, and he's not at the top of Beijing's regional pecking order in Latin America. Beijing has far closer ties with other countries in the region, even if Brazil is the biggest one. So that's one of the constraints. But there's another set of constraints. And I think it's very important for US policymakers to understand this, because this shapes the way any Brazilian leader is bound to deal with China. And this is the fact that in the last 20 years, there's been a, the birth of pro-China constituency groups at home. So even when you have a president like Bolsonaro, who promised to move Brazil away from China, to align with the Trump administration. You know, Bolsonaro took out time from his campaign trail to fly to Taiwan, to campaign in Taiwan, mm -hmm. trying to poke the Chinese in the eyes mm -hmm. and promised to sever ties with China. He couldn't do it because his own domestic political base in Congress would prevent him from doing that. Brazilian leaders increasingly have their hands tied simply because China is such an important economic magnet and breaking that is going to be really tricky. Now, if you think the future of US-China relations is relatively peaceful, this needn't be a problem. You know, Brazil will become more enmeshed, more interdependent with China. Lots of Brazilian interest groups will derive their bread and butter from trade with China and Chinese finance. And we won't see a problem. In fact, this is exactly what the Clinton administration had in mind. And then subsequent administrations, when they encouraged China to come to Latin America, to join the Inter-American Development Bank, for example, because it was a useful way to have excess capital coming from China, fill a void that the United States was not willing or not able to fill itself. The problem is, Chris, if we think that the future of US-China relations is going to be more conflictual, then we're in deep trouble. Because then the United States will have a, an int a, a, a big incentive to try and push and shove countries in Latin America, and Brazil in particular, to sever ch ties with China, and they won't be able to do it. Because domestically, this will be politically impossible. And then the United States will, will have very little choice but to play regional hegemon and lay down the law. We saw something like this happen in the past. In the 1930s, the extra regional power that had extensive economic ties with Latin America was Germany. And it took an awful lot of time for the United States to be able to force or nudge and cajole countries from Latin America to sever ties with the Reich, not the least Brazil. 
So it really depends on what the future holds. My po basic point is there's no reason why the United States should go around now rhetorically pushing these countries to sever ties with China without offering anything in return, which is the situation we're in now. The so successive ministers of, you know, secretaries of defense come to Brazil to tell China Brazilians, you know, have them not do deals with Huawei, for example. But what's on offer? And the, simply there's nothing there. So the status quo is okay if the future of US-China relations is okay, but it's not okay if we assume that in the future, the US and China are going to be in a more contentious, difficult, conflictual relationship. I, I think it's fascinating what you say, because obviously that applies not just to Brazil, but also to other countries in Latin America and around the world. Things are going to get much more difficult for the United States in its relationship with many of these pivotal states if the relationship with China overall becomes sharper and sharper. I wonder if we can spend a minute talking about the environment because it's such a, a key part of the U.S.-Brazil relationship. One of the questions that I've had when I've looked at this is how much can the United States actually do to try to improve the situation in Brazil? It's obviously a very complicated domestic political economic problem for Brazil. And is what are the things that the United States could really do in order to help to reduce or even uh, halt deforestation of the rainforest? Margaret, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Matias would have a better sense of the, the levers that can be pulled, you know, within mm -hmm. Brazil to, 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 you know, promote some degree of, of positive change. But what I can say is that, you know, um, I think there is a sense within the U.S. right now that more does does in fact need to be done, and a realization that the you know the five hundred million dollar commitment to the Amazon fund right really did fall short of what Brazil would have hoped for. Um, it was especially when you look at sort of the numbers that <laughs> that China tends to throw around, right, which are are, are quite large. They don't always come to pass, but uh, five hundred million doesn't sound like a, a lot, even though it's a contribution to a fund that is, you know, multilateral in nature. Um, but it seems, you know, understanding this, that, that the Biden administration is looking to increase this amount now, right, by mobilizing something in the neighborhood of $1 billion to support land restoration with some of that coming from, from the DFC. So if that materializes, it will hopefully, you know, make more of a dis difference for the, for the Amazon and, and for the bilateral relationship. But I'd say that, I mean, the tools that the U.S. has at its disposal right now are, are, are limited. And they're not quick. <laughs> and this is something that, you know, that, I mean, applies to, to the whole of Latin America as, as countries look for assistance from the U.S., as the countries look to engage with the U.S. I, I, just as Matias said, you know, there, are, there, are, there is interest in, in diversifying partnerships. It makes good sense to do so, right, away from China, including in the infrastructure sector, um, to have wide-ranging partners working in, in, in wide-ranging industries. Um, but uh, if the finance isn't there, if it isn't there in the right amount, or if the DFC can't lend to a certain country because it's an SOE, right, that might be running the project, project or if, you know, it, it happens to be a middle income country or a country with which the U.S. has not so strong relations, um, then, then that ends up being problematic. So I would say okay. that there are some restrictions on our toolkit that will make more engagement, including on the in the climate space, a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm, sure. Matias, do you, do you agree with that? I mean, how does it look from a domestic political economy perspective there in Sao Paulo? Great. So Brazil's deforestation problem and climate problem in, in general is gargantuan, right? Mm -hmm. Partly because so many millions pe of people depend on carbon emissions for, for their living. You know, land use is the major driver of carbon emissions in Brazil, and Brazil lives off land use. So transitioning to anything different is going to cost tens of billions of dollars. And within that, America, there's very little the United States can do. I mean, it's great to provide some support to the Amazon fund, but no amount of money will be sufficient compared to what Brazil needs. So I wouldn't bet that the future of the US-Brazil relationship should center around that. But there's an opportunity now. Brazil is about to unveil its own IRA. So the Ministry of Finance and Brazil's National Development Bank are about to announce a series of measures. It's basically subsidies. It's basically industrial policy, like the Biden administration, to facilitate a transition to a lower carbon economy. The task to get that to work 
without major corruption scandals, without major inefficiencies, is going to be enormous. And there is a real opportunity there for collaboration between the two countries, in particular the private sectors in the two countries. The other area where there is a lot of room for collaboration, but a lot of danger, is on the issue of climate-related organized crime. One of the problems Brazil faces in the Amazon in particular is that organized crime is behind cattle laundering, illegal logging, illegal mining. For example, when the Lula administration took office, the Minister of the Environment found out that within the Amazon region, there are over 1,500 illegal airstrips. And the problem with illegal airstrips in a landmass that equals the size of Europe, the problem with the air, airstrips is that if you bomb them from the air with support from the federal police, say, they get rebuilt within three or four days. Mm. Now, no talk of America cooperating militarily or even police cooperation in Brazil will fly. Right. Because Brazilian elites are terrified of an American military presence in South America. The worst um, nightmare for Brazilians in the last 30 years in regional politics was Plan Colombia, when there was American military involvement in a neighboring country in a part of South America that's very hard to control because it's so deeply forested. So none of that will fly, but what can fly is cooperation to help Brazil deal with the end of the illegal trade um, cycle, which is trade through the Atlantic going into Africa and then to Europe, where the consumer markets are for the drugs, mm -hmm. for the illegal logging, for the illegal mining, so on and so forth. So intelligence cooperation, military to military cooperation outside right. the Amazon. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think that would be an opportunity. But again, as Margaret said, the America's ability to support Brazil in this is going to be limited. Mm, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, Matias, I want to stay with you as we start to take some of the questions from our audience, because we have one here that I know that you've spent some time thinking about. As uh, everyone is aware, this uh, is part of a broader series that we're doing on pivotal states, and we have been focused on many states that are referred to as emerging powers or sometimes as the global south. We've had discussions about Turkey, about India, and now about Brazil. And so we have an interesting question from one of our audience members here who is wondering um, how you see the uh, similarities and differences between Brazilian strategic thinking and some of these other emerging powers in the BRICS uh, and also more broadly, how would you compare the way that Brazil sees the world uh, to these other emerging powers? Okay, so let me take, let me take two, uh, India and Indonesia. These are countries that are in many respects parallel to Brazil. Brazil has had increasingly positive and closer ties with these countries. These are countries that see themselves as countries coming from a post-colonial experience that are moving up the ranks in the world. So how, what can we say about the comparisons? Um, this is really tricky. India is in an enviable position from Brazil's standpoint because India can trade support with the United States in ways that Brazil cannot. India matters geopolitically in the context of counterbalancing China and India is making a buck out of this mostly through military cooperation, military purchases, uh, a phenomenal diaspora that is highly educated, that is well employed in the United States, and it's very numerous. Brazil doesn't have any of this. So we cannot really compare what's happening in the ties between Washington and New Delhi to Washington and Brasilia. Brazil is much weaker. Then take Indonesia. Indonesia too is a country whose foreign policy resembles Brazil's a lot. When you listen uh, diplomats from Indonesia talk, it sounds like a Brazilian is talking. You know, Jokowi, the president, is the only man I believe in the last few months to have met the president of the United States, Russia, and Ukraine, right? Um, this is a man who sees themselves, them, himself 
as trying to hedge his bets and not take sides and benefit from the existing competition. But again, Indonesia is in a part of the world that China claims and is increasingly claiming and its own, as its own regional hegemony, right? So the differences are enormous. Stuart Patrick from Carnegie has a piece out with foreign affairs a couple of days ago saying, this is why we shouldn't really call the global south the global south. It's so diverse a group. How much does the global south carry as water, you know, as an analytical concept? My answer to that will be to say, Stuart is right. This is a very diverse set of countries, but there is something that unites them. And what unites them is a common experience of being at the bottom end of a global hierarchy. These are countries that have an experience with colonialism, with economic injustice, with racial injustice, and this provides a common ground. Does this mean they produce a common platform and they are united in multilateral fora? No. I mean, part of the reason why the Doha round never flew is because Brazil and India ended up being divided among themselves. Um, but there's something there. So the comparison between Brazil and other global South countries makes sense. And what unites them is this experience. And therefore, they're united in the belief that unipolarity is not good for them. So defending the global liberal international order is not going to fly with them because they see advantage in having not only a strong China, but also a strong Russia. They have a common geopolitical outlook. Margaret, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I agree entirely with, with Matthias on all, on all of these points. Um, yeah, I don't have much to add to, to, to that. Question. One question is about Turkey. I don't know. We have a question here from someone about whether or not there are similarities between Brazil and Turkey. I mean, Turkey obviously has a very unique geopolitical um, circumstance simply because of its proximity to Russia and to Ukraine, which puts it in a special place with regard to uh, at least the, 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 its role in the U.S.-Russia and NATO-Russia relationship. Situation is a little bit different with regard to China. Um, you know, Br Brazil seems a little bit more neutral, perhaps a little bit closer to China, simply because of the economic realities that we have been discussing. Uh, but those economic realities go two ways, right? I mean, China is a major importer of Brazilian food, which would seem to me to be, and it would give it um, perhaps not leverage, but at least some some degree of significance in China's foreign policy thinking. And I know you're not China foreign policy experts, but I put that out there as, as a thought. I mean, does that strike you as as roughly accurate, Matthias, as we think through, or, or Margaret, as we think through um, how Brazil compares to these other players in the global south? Yeah. Sure. Um, there's an interesting story of Erdogan and Lula. They both got elected at the same time, and they were both hosted at the White House on the same day in the George W. Bush administration. And that day, December 2002, Condoleezza Rice came up with a framework, and she said these are emerging nations that are bound to be more powerful and influential as time goes on. This is 20 years ago now, 21 years ago now. And since then, Turkey and Brazil have gone in very different directions, not the least because Turkey has become an autocracy, and Brazil has not become an autocracy, and Bolsonaro, the threat to Brazilian democracy, was defeated in the polls. In, in, in the electoral booth. Now, the commonalities are there. Again, when you listen to diplomats from Turkey and Brazil talk, a lot of parallels, a lot of parallels. But there are fundamental differences. One is a relationship with China, as you point out, Chris. But the other one is that Turkey is dependent on Russia in ways that Brazil isn't. Brazil is very willing to throw its support for Putin within the BRICS but Brazil voted against Russia in the United Nations. It will publicly critique the invasion of the Ukraine. And yet, when push comes to shove, as we have seen, Lula has made all these statements that sound really pro-Russia, right? And if you ask Brazilian diplomats, they will tell you that one of the people they admire the most is Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. I think the same would happen in Turkey. But Turkey has a dependence on Russia that is much closer, even if it's a member of NATO, it needs Russia to deal with problems in its own neighborhood, not only Syria, right? So again, there are common patterns, there's a common language, there's a common outlook on global order, 
but that doesn't mean that interests are aligned. Circumstances are very, very different. And all these countries, although they're much stronger than smaller countries in their own regions, all of them, they are relatively weak geopolitically still. India might be the outlier there, as it is becoming very evidently ever more powerful. Sure, sure. Margaret, please, uh, let, let, me, let me actually pose a, a, a question to you that's along these lines from one of our members of the audience, uh, which I think sort of encapsulates some of what we're trying to get at here. And this is, you know, how might the United States create a positive agenda towards Brazil or even the region more broadly that's also aimed at countering Chinese influence in the region. This is something that you think about. I mean, what are the what are the keys to to, to doing this in a way that um, you know is is smart and sophisticated? Yeah, let, let me make let me just uh, one note about one story about sort of the the uniqueness of the of the Brazil China relationship, and then I'll I'll, I'll answer that right away. Right, but right. this is, I mean. Um, you know, obviously we can make comparisons. I think everything that, that Matias said is, is absolutely spot on, but there is something really quite unique, certainly within the Latin American context, but even globally uh, about, about China's view of and, and engagement with, with Brazil. And a lot of that is related to this very personal relationship that the leaders there have struck with Lula, in my view, at least. And I wonder yeah. if you would agree, Matias, but I remember being, I mean, gosh, it must've been 2010 being in, in China and seeing on the front of papers, on newspapers, you know, Lula hugging Hu Jintao at the time, right? These these embraces, you know, talk of brotherhood, just of, of a deep love for Lula and a respect for him as a leader. And so it was kind of, you know, it seemed to me a natural conclusion that Lula would, you know, again, engage very extensively with China. And while trying, obviously, to balance something of a relationship with the U.S., but to, to th this would be, you know, this outreach would be really quite extensive. And indeed it was when you looked at sort of the size of the delegation, right, that went to China, all of the agreements that were signed, everything that was done in the fanfare, the fanfare that accompanied it. Um, so it's it's unique. And then obviously, as you mentioned, Chris, I mean, this 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 agricultural dynamic is fundamental, right, and drives so much of it. And just as Matias mentioned, it's a codependence, which is really quite interesting. You don't see that in the rest of Latin America, right, mm -hmm. at least not to the same degree. Uh, really, you know, China is heavily dependent on Brazil for exports of soy, not to consumed directly by humans, but for animal feed, right? And uh, and especially so, you know, given the, the U.S.-China uh, trade war and, and the effects on, on, you know, the exportation of soy from the U.S. of late. So it's a really, really interesting and unique dynamic in its own right. How do you engage Brazil in a way, uh, in a positive way, while, yeah. you know, while also um, countering or, or working to compete, I guess is the, the term we're using uh, du jour, right, uh, to compete more effectively with China in in the region, you know, I think there are a few things that, that that can be done. First of all, you know, I'm a big proponent of greater economic engagement with the region generally, right? Given longstanding feelings among among regional leaders that the Latin American region has has all but abandoned the U.S., um, you know, and engagement, especially on economic terms, as the U.S. looks to compete more effectively with China um, in, in this another. Do you mean free free trade, or, or what, what are you thinking about in particular? Uh, no, I mean trade is a is a bit of a we're at a bit of an impasse with that. Right. But, but uh, certainly, you know, as, uh, economic assistance in various forms, okay. right, and also investment, especially in the case of Brazil. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, as the U.S. looks to reduce reliance on China and secure supply chains, right, which has a big been a big part of, right. of uh, you know, of, of an effort to to reduce reliance on China and to reorient production to, towards parts of the region. It's my view that. Brazil can and should play a role in this process, right? Especially in the production of higher value added products. The US, the US right now is a major contributor to, to value added production across the region. This is not something that we talk about enough uh, and should engage with Brazil in these terms as it has you know, for, for many, many decades, um, but also with the, the, much of the rest of the region um, and to do so with this value added proposition uh, very much front of mind, right? The problem is this idea of friendshoring, right? Um, creating opportunities for countries with, with demonstrated commitment to U.S. interests, and Brazil has a mixed record there, right? Um, yeah. Friendshoring is necessarily exclusive, uh, it just by by nature, right? So maybe we ought to think about this as as a making friendshoring or something of of, of that nature. Um, uh, the, it strikes me that the administration would seem to be taking this to heart right now, at least to some degree, having just talked about a jobs initiative uh, with Brazil, which could be great depending on its scale. Um, 
I think also, you know, another thing that needs to be done, and, and I think this is being done to a certain degree, um, is, is bringing Brazil into the fold, right? As in this recent G7 meeting, acknowledging its prominence on the global mm -hmm. stage and in global agenda setting. Um, this is a, I think, a critical component, component to maintaining fruitful bilateral ties and, and, and to ensuring at least some alignment on, on issues of global interest, even though obviously, you know, there is this profound commitment as, as Matias mentioned to, um, you know, to avoiding a, a, a you know, particularly polarized or over-reliance on, on, on one single partner or on the U.S. in general. Um, so for that matter, you know, is maintaining and strengthening and making more productive the many existing mechanisms for, for bilateral cooperation that already exist. And there are many of them. I don't need to list them all here, but the Critical Minerals Working Group, right, the uh, U.S.-Brazil Commercial Dialogue, there's a Defense Industry Dialogue, there are all sorts of different things happening. Um, at the moment. And some of these, you know, in some of these, ideally, there will be areas of convergence, if not in economic terms, if not, you know, a com competition directly within, for example, the infrastructure realm, there may be um, a, a degree of policy coordination that can be, uh, you know, um, achieved through these mechanisms, through these platforms that would be beneficial as the U.S. looks to compete in broader terms uh, with China, uh, not just in Brazil, but globally. Chris, could I could I just say a couple of things which I think are, are of interest? During the presidential campaign just now here in Brazil, Lula started using a language that really struck me and my colleagues as strange. He began to say, we won't let China buy Brazil. So mm -hmm. what's the story there? Because as Margaret pointed out, Lula has a, a long track record of very friendly relationships with China and the Chinese leadership. So we ended up running this big survey to try and understand how Brazilians see foreign direct investment and in particular how they compare foreign direct investment coming from China to that coming from the United States, Europe and the rest of Latin America. And to our surprise, there is a lot of anti-China sentiment across Brazil, both left and right, but more pronounced on the right and a fear that dependence on China is particularly dangerous. Interestingly, none of what drives these effects is um, xenophobia against the Chinese. It's more a sense that increasing dependence on China puts Brazil in a very fragile position. And maybe this helps explain why even Lula needs to watch his words in a campaign context to counterbalance the very warm body language he has with China with something else on the other side. And the, my second point is, I think it, it's very relevant now because policymakers in DC are trying to make sense of how to deal with Brazil moving forward. And one of the arguments, as Margaret said, and it's always been my own argument, is to say, well, if Brazil is demanding more recognition as an important player, just give it. Give it to it and then see what you can get in return. The problem is, I think this argument no longer flies now. After the Ukraine war, I think ties were very, very um, hurt. Uh, I think the sense in the White House is that the language Lula has used to lay part of the blame for the war on Zelensky and the language he has used to suggest that the United States is somehow one of the causes behind the war has made any notion, any argument that the United States should give Brazil more recognition as having a higher status, if you want, in the world, is very hard to sell politically in Washington now. That's why my sense is that moving forward, at least for the remainder of this administration, the best one can aspire to is to have a good back channel relationship that deals mm -hmm. with the need greedy of a few topics where interests are aligned and even then you will have to do a lot of political maneuvering to get the two sides to actually deliver cooperation. So this is Pivotal States here. I've got uh, Margaret Myers with me from Washington, D.C., Matias Spector uh, in Sao Paulo. We're talking about Brazil uh, and we're coming to the close of this session. But uh, before we do that, I, I want to ask each of you um, again, uh, if you were to have a couple of minutes in the Oval Office, uh, what's the main point that you would try to get across to President Biden 
uh, in terms of what he needs to do uh, in, with, in, with regard to the bilateral relationship between the United States and Brazil. Margaret, let me start with you. What's the main thing you would want him to come away with? I think three things that, you know, just as I mentioned, the economic relationship is um, is on a bit of sort of, sort of an auto drive, right? There, there, there's a lot of interest from both sides. This is longstanding, but there are ways to engage more extensively and potentially through these sort of nearshoring mechanisms, policies, you know, tools that are being put in place, implemented. And there are examples of this actually happening in certain industries. I think Brazil is very well positioned uh, to be a, a, you know, a player in this to be a beneficiary of, of, of this um, to the extent potentially that, you know, some of the policies that Matias was recommending and or was mentioning and that and that the U.S. has put forth, um, you know, a line, especially. Right. Um, and that there may be some really tremendous areas of cooperation in the area of of energy. Right. And uh, and also jobs creation and related to those in other strategic sectors. So um, these I mean, that that seems to me absolutely fundamental, a sort of broadening of this notion of friendshoring to include other actors such as Brazil, which will be able to contribute to high value add production in the region and the securitization of supply chains. Beyond that, I would just say that, you know, obviously, I think this is understood now, but uh, you know, anti-China rhetoric is a no-go. Uh, trying to uh, to recruit the, Brazil uh, to um, to become part of a an anti-China coalition in the region not is work. not going to work, right? And and the Brazil is not going to be interested in the sorts of you know clean technology and other arrangements that have been negotiated in places like Costa Rica of late, right? In, in collaboration with the EU, for example. So um, so it's a matter, just as Matias mentioned, of finding those niche areas where there are you know. There is significant overlapping interest and, and pursuing those um, in whatever form possible. That's great. Matthias, what about you? I would tell President Biden three things. First of all, get your private sectors talking about a transition to a lower carbon economy and exploring how government in both countries can support that private sector cooperation across the board. And the second thing I would say is sit down and begin a conversation that's never had on how the two countries as food suppliers and the two countries as major oil producers moving forward can cooperate in a scenario in which geopolitically the world becomes bumpier in the future. So you don't frame it as anti-China because that will not fly as Margaret was explaining, but at least you create a framework in which productive cooperation can take place in two areas where both the United States and Brazil are going to stand out in the 21st century, irrespective of what happens with China. That's great. This has been a fascinating discussion and I thank everyone who's been listening in. We've had a great audience and great questions. Uh, Margaret, Matias, thanks so much for joining us here on Pivotal States. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you as these things uh, unfold over the course of the coming months and years. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Chris.